Good morning. I, too, am glad you're here. Thank God for visitors. And we thank the Lord for all those who are watching on the screen. And as we say often, you're uh, on your phone, the computer, uh, listening by radio. We're just glad to have everybody with us. Wilmington is watching. Hey, guys, down in Wilmington and at Lake Park, we're just delighted to have everybody join in. It's time for the word of the Lord. You've heard great music, great, great music from a, a wonderful and talented group of people. And sometimes, David, I don't mean to, but I forget to mention the orchestra and all of these other, you, they, they are the best. They're the best. You guys, I mean that. Sometimes your spirit is so overwhelming. I feel so lifted and free and full, but I'm also aware of my heaviness and my worldliness, the things that I've not yet released that keep me bound and unable to throw myself to fling myself in your arms. I pray for help, for divine spiritual help to say what needs to be said. I pray that you will give me a tear and a boldness. And may the congregation understand that this is not a man talking. This is the Lord Jesus. And I ask it in that sweet name we pray. And uh, Lord, guide us. We are, as I have said so many times lately, we are a country in a mess. And our world is upside down. Let me change that, Lord. The world we live in is upside down. The country we live in is upside down. We belong to a different country and we're headed to a different world. But we happen to be assigned here now. And so we pray that our prayers will make a difference. Our living will in, in, instruct and correct and influence people to know that there is a true and living God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. You, you can be seated. We'll see where we're headed here in just a moment. These last two songs, of course, talked about the coming of the Lord, and I sensed that many of you are ready for that. Yeah. Anticipate that. The song Larry just finished. The signs of the times are everywhere. And I, I guess you're thinking that I'm going to start listing things that are happening in the world that indicate that the coming of the Lord is soon. But I'm not. I'm going to list the things that are happening in the church that equally and as forcefully indicate that we're in the last days and Jesus is indeed coming soon. But you have to remember he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a church that doesn't tolerate sin or accept it. He's coming back for a people who hate sin, who long, who Hunger for righteousness. So let's begin. 
I, I see in the church, and I told the first crowd, I'm not trying to pastor the world. This is not the worldwide anything here. I'm pastoring Central Church, and we just happen to be on the Internet. You're the ones I care about. I'm not trying to say things to influence people in other states and other countries. This is my bailiwick. This is my sign. This is my responsibility. And I will stand before him one day and I will give an account for how I spoke from this pulpit and what I said. So when I tell you that you can look at the church and see that the end is near, I'm talking about the rampant sin that takes place in the pews and that people are no longer stung or convicted by things that the Bible calls transgression, iniquity, sin. It's everywhere. And it's like people want to be connected to a church, but they don't want to live by the Scriptures. And so if their connection is just to the Scriptures, to the church just to have friends and groups and get married and be buried, then there is no affection for the holiness of God. They just want to belong to a group. <clears throat> so what happens as time progresses, the church devolves, the so-called church. I'll start with this one. Adultery. Adultery no longer causes people to fall at the feet of Jesus and cry out for, for forgiveness. Adultery is that sin that we have justified saying, well, God knows how I am and I'm not happy at home and God knew I would do this. He, he does. But as a Christian, you can be forgiven but you will pay a price. You will be corrected. You will be chastised by God and it will not be pleasant. Well, God forgives all sins. He does. But he will also send you through the school of correction. And you will rue the day that you chose fleshly pleasure and self-satisfaction over obedience to the almighty word of God. Adultery is everywhere, and nobody seems to be upset about it. You know, I knew I would get loose at this one. Um, we, we've had couples in this church swap. You know, he, he decided to get with his wife, and she decided to get with her husband and all that. And, and of course, our pastors corrected them and said, you can't do that here. They went to another church. And we found out about it, and one of our pastors called that other church in this town and said, just for accountability's sake, one pastor to another, one church to another, we think you ought to know that they are here because they didn't want to be under someone's authority and do the right thing. And that church said, we don't care. That's your business with them. We don't care. So now... It's all about getting as many people in the pews no matter how they're living than it is being accountable as pastors and as members of the body of Christ. Adultery is rampant. How about abortion? I got literally physically sick when I heard that the governor of New York, you know, this country is being led by priests and priestesses of Satan. You need to know that Jezebel is way up there. We got some Jezebels making some inroads into the, the, the future of this country. God help this country. And abortion does no longer have the stigma that it had. It's an abortion. Hey, you get it done, you get forgiveness. It's murder. And when I heard that New York and their other states had passed the law, and I don't know the proper terminology, that a baby can be aborted up to delivery. 
I got sick on my stomach. This is pure murder. Don't, how can you argue with that? Murder is the termination of innocent human life. Murder is premeditated termination of innocent human life. How can you argue with that? It's scriptural, and yet now we're treating it like it's a, a medical situation, a surgical process. The blood of innocent human beings is running down the streets of this country knee-high now. Brother, it's sin, and it's in the church. And God can forgive you, but you will pay for it the rest of your life. How about homosexuality? Uh-oh. I've heard over and over again, preachers are supposed to preach love and acceptance. No, we're supposed to preach the scriptures. Love is always the right thing to do, but not acceptance. I can love you, but not accept you. But you need to understand that even though society's changing and preachers don't have the spine anymore to call this out, and the church seems to be diminishing its conviction of same-sex relationships, whether you call it marriage or not, God has not changed his mind. And Romans chapter 1 says, For the express purpose of men sleeping with men and women sleeping with women, the wrath of God is going to be poured out on this world. For that sin, exactly. So I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, for me to stand here and say, we have to accept, makes me a false prophet. It makes me a coward in the pulpit. To love you makes me a man. But to tell you the truth says I love you enough to offend you with God's word. What about the sexual immorality? I'm, I'm just talking about sexual immorality. I'm not talking about homosexuality or anything. Just the pornography. Just people in the pew shacking up with one another outside of matrimony. Just living together. It's an inconvenience to go through the legal process or whatever. It's the thing you do today. It's how young women thank the young man for the dinner they just had by inviting them into their bed. It's what people do now to express themselves. And I'm not talking about a perverted world. I'm not talking about Hollywood. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about this place. I'm talking about these pews. I'm talking about people that raise their hands when Larry's saying Jesus is coming back or Lauren's saying or anybody else. Because we have gotten so far from God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit that we think this is just a Sunday morning event where you feel better when you leave. You know, two weeks ago I was in a, another state and I was with pastors. Every one of those pastors said to me, I feel like nobody ever listens anymore. I don't even know why I preach the way I preach. People go out and do whatever they want to do. I am not making a difference. I seek God's face. I seek his word. I get up. I preach. I cry. I fight the devil. And then people just kind of laugh and go out and do whatever they want to do and come back the next Sunday after they've done whatever they did. That's where we are, folks. You've got ministers, good men and women of God who's, who feel discouraged 
and weary because it seems that the sheep don't want to hear the truth anymore. And just sin just keeps piling up in the ranks. What about divorce? Nobody ever says anything about that anymore except God. Here's what God says. I hate divorce. He said that. I hate it. He's not changed. Pastor, you don't know what it's like to live with what? Live with what? Live with whom? Well, Pastor, God wants me to be happy. No, he doesn't. Not if your happiness violates his word and his heart. No, God wants you to work it out. This pitiful, sick society. You know, here's the, I'm just going to tell you the truth. My least favorite pastoral thing to do is a wedding. I prefer to shuffle it off to some other pastor. Because as the years have gone by, I've seen that the reverence of the ceremony and the meaning of the contract and the commitment in the words have evaporated. It's just a show. Let's buy a dress. Let's get some people wearing dresses. Let's get this over with and go out and party and then have sex all night long and then go down to the islands and have sex ten times a day. And if you haven't already been doing it, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> it ain't all that <clears throat> all the time. <clears throat> it ain't all that when it's new and fresh and exciting. For long. But when you get into the years of living together, and you start saying, I just don't feel happy. I'm not fulfilled. I just, where's the fire? Where's the excitement? It went the way of everything else. Fires die down, emotions calm down. But commitment is supposed to be for life. I've actually done weddings on this stage where I said to people, I just want to get this over with. They're already sleeping together. They cannot wait to get somewhere and get drunk. And I've married people with alcohol on their breath already. What are y'all acting like that for? You, are they actually shocked or are they just feeling sorry for me? And when any relationship is built on lust and excitement and fire and uh, adventure, it's not going to last long. You're going to have to learn to live through it all. And it's not always good. You're going to have to learn to walk through the valley of disappointment and still hold hands and Walk through the valley of the shadow of death and still hug when you come out. You're going to have to learn to turn, look the other way and forgive and put up with and tolerate. You can't just say, we're going to be divorced. I'm divorcing. What? What? You are saying, I'm going to violate what God hates. God didn't go into a big long spiel. He said, I hate divorce, period. That ought to be enough. But I'm going to do it anyway, and then God will forgive me. I've heard that. I've heard that. And you know, I'm going to let you and God work that out. I know there's forgiveness for every sin, and I know that he forgives and forgives and forgives. But I also know this, and I'm being repetitive here. You will pay a price the rest of your life. Now here it is. If you're shacking up, if you're living together, if you're not married, you got a choice. 
You can either get married, then God will see that you mean business. Or you can bust up and get out of sin. That's the only way you can do it. But to continue to go to church in sin, you are taunting the Holy Spirit of God. I'm done with that subject. I'm going to the next one. (laughs) Within the ranks of the church these days, especially among Pentecostals, there's a newfound freedom. People have found out that they can drink. And as long as they don't get drunk, they're okay. I laugh at some of the people I, my age who grew up in the Pentecostal church and, and now you can do it, you're free, you're a fool. You act like an idiot. Look what I can do now. Are you any closer to Christ than you were? Are you really freer than you were? Or have you picked up another addiction? Have you grabbed another bondage? What good comes from it? Did did, did you hear me? What good comes from it? That's all I'm going to say about that, except I'm going to read some scripture here. This is from the Proverbs. You ready? This is about alcohol. Now, look at me. Look at me. I have no right to tell you you can't have a glass of wine. It's not in here. I have no right to tell you you can't touch it. That's not in here. But what I do have an obligation to tell you is it's a gateway. And very few people do it less than they used to. And very few people do it the same as they used to. So let the wise man talk from the Proverbs. You got it up there? Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Don't change yet, Stephen. Put it back. You know what he's saying? Who's the person that always has trouble in his life? Who's the person swallowed up with sorrow all the time? Who has contentions? Can't get along with anybody. You better hear me when I tell you alcohol and violence go together. Alcohol and irritation, agitation go together. Who has complaints? Hey, everything's wrong. Why didn't they do it this way? Why do they treat me that way? They fired me from my job. Nobody likes me at my work. Who has wounds without cause? They hurt me. Who has redness of eyes? That's self-explanatory. Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. You know what he's saying there? You better not believe those commercials. Don't look at that and say, you know, I got it. That's I'd like to. When you cut the grass and you're hot and you come in in July and flip on the ball game and there comes that huge mug of cold, gold and bubbly stuff or you see this couple sitting at wine looking at each other romantically uh, with, with a glass of wine beginning to tip it and then they smile he said that ain't what you ought to be looking at at the last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper your eyes will see strange things. And your heart will utter perverse things. Yeah, I'm talking to Christians. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, meaning you're just floating all around. Your stomach's upset, your head's upset, you don't know where it are. Or one who lies at the top of the mast saying, they struck me, but I was not hurt. They beaten me, but I did not feel it. They beat me up, I didn't even feel a thing. But what he does say is, 
When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? You live for the next drink, the next party, the next event, the next reason to consume more. You know why? Because human beings, including Christians, cannot control themselves. You cannot control yourself. You have to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And you will not be controlled unless you live on your knees and live in this book. And it wouldn't hurt to stay in church. Here's another sin in the church. I call it pulpit politics. It's when preachers, so called, get up in the house of God behind the sacred desk of God and preach politics and parties and social injustice and we got to fix it and let's rally and let's stand up and let's fight. The pulpit was designed as a place to declare the whole counsel of God, to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The house of God was not designed to be a convention center where you rally people together who've all been wounded and they've got a cause. It was the place where God designed that sinners could come in and get saved and Christians could get blessed and the word of the Lord would go forth. Wow, that was an overwhelming response right there now. No man or woman of God called by God is going to stand in the pulpit and do anything except preach God's word. If they don't, they're a false prophet. They're a false teacher. They're a professional. Because a real man or woman of God filled with the Holy Spirit cannot but Speak of the things they've seen and heard. And I come to this next one. I don't know why I don't just pick this up. <laughs> I'm trying to hide it with my foot and y'all are watching that. I wonder what's on that card there. Ooh. It's a tithing envelope. I stuck it in there to keep my place. Obviously, I've lost my place. <laughs> I don't know how many sins I've mentioned, but here's the one I think is the grossest, the most blatant, and the most justified of all of them. The sin of materialism. When that's all you hear on Christian television... We're in the last days. When that's what all the preachers are trying to do is raise more money, we're in the last days. When Christians find themselves aggressively going after anything but Jesus, we're in the last days and we're operating in materialism. If you're reading through the Bible with us this year, you have... I don't know if I've gotten ahead. Maybe I've gotten ahead. I don't know. But I was reading in Exodus. And I think this is the most uh, interesting passage of Scripture that I've found in a long time. Nine plagues have taken place against Egypt. The last one's coming. It's the big one. And God says to Moses, go tell Israel... Go throughout the homes of the Egyptians, contact every one of them, and borrow silver and gold and stuff. Just borrow it. And the Bible says that the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. And because the Lord gave Israel favor with the Egyptians, the Israelites would come up and say, Hey, can I borrow some of your gold? Hey, I need some silver. I need some money. I need some pots and pans. And they said, I take it. 
God's favor was on them. Take it. Just take it. Here's an amazing scripture. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses and they had asked from the Egyptian, Egyptians articles of silver, gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. Watch. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Plundered the Egyptians. You see, isn't that great? Look what God will do for you. That's not the point. Here's the point that God was saying, the first lesson I'm going to teach you is that when you go where I'm going to take you, that stuff's not going to help you. So what am I talking about? So now, all the people, they were slaves. Uneducated slaves. They didn't even know how to fight. So now they, in tattered garments, with brand new rolled up clothes under their arm, pull in wagons full of gold and silver and pots and pans, dragging bags of it, saying, help me, putting them on between two poles and walking. They got so much, so many riches. And all of a sudden, now they're out in the wilderness. What you gonna do with it? Look at all this money. There's nothing to buy. <laughs> Look at all this gold. I got it stacked up in front of my tent with these new clothes on. But I'm thirsty. There's no water to buy. Uh, we're hungry. There's no food. Here's what God was saying to them, but he's saying it to us now. All you will ever need in this wilderness of life is me. I will wait. I will give you food when you need it and water when you are thirsty. And not only that, I will be a covering. I will build, be a cloud between you and the scorching sun. And I will be a wall of fire between you and your enemy. All you need is me. And you can drag all that stuff, accumulate it in your life, build it up, have more than you need, accrue much more than you even can imagine, and all you're going to do is drag it through life and try to manage it because it won't bring you happiness and it won't satisfy you and it won't protect you and it won't provide for you. How much are you dragging around? How much is the world's stuff has burdened you and yet you still go after it. I, if I could get back to where I was or if I could get a little more. Than, and God is saying, I'm all you need. There is no greater act of faith than to say, God, I believe you're going to take care of me. And I'm going to have everything you think I need. I don't have to kill myself, scratch my fingers to the bone, have a meeting, wear myself out. All I need to do is trust you. And oh, just think, just think of the tons of stuff we Christians are dragging through this life, ladies and gentlemen. And God, he was saying to the Egyptians, or to the Israelites, that's what you wanted. Oh, the whole time you were slave, you were always saying, they got stuff we don't. Look at that new chariot. Look at those rams. Oh, look, they wear the finest sandals. Look at that. They got bread in the house every day. Oh. God said, that's what you want? I'm going to let you have it. But then after you get it, you'll see that you didn't need it because I am your life. Here's the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. When, when after 40 years passed and it was time to go into the promised land, they still had, a, still had all that stuff. And so they send spies into the promised land. Remember the story? And the spies come back after 40 days. And two of them, Josh and Caleb, said, 
Let's go do it. Let's get it. Let's take it. Hey, it's, it's, it's for us. God said we could. God said he'd help us. It's ours for the taking. But then you had the worldlings. And they said, well, we better think about this a little bit. Think about it. Just think about it. We were there too. We didn't see what they saw. We outnumbered them. We had 20 eyes. They had four. We didn't see the same thing. What we saw was a land that's going to eat us up and huge people who make us feel like grasshoppers. Therefore, we vote to stay on this side. Joshua and Caleb said, are you crazy? God is the one that said it's ours. God is the one that said go take it. They said, nope. Because they still had their mind on riches and safety and who's in charge, etc. Can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? One of the reasons that the church is not bold anymore, one of the reasons the house of God doesn't fill up when you call a prayer meeting, one of the reasons preachers are afraid to speak out against sin is because we have sin in the camp. And sin brings fear, and fear brings doubt, and doubt brings guilt, and guilt creates an inferiority complex. You know, it just dawned on me one day. I hear people all the time say, I feel so guilty. I'm just so guilty. Well, sometimes we're guilty because we are. We're disobeying God. We're doing what we ought not do. And when you live that way, in your own eyes, you are nothing but a grasshopper. Even though this word says, everywhere you place your foot, I'll give it to you. No demon has power over you. No weapon that the devil can create can destroy you. The one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. And if you don't have your mind on God's word and you don't get the stuff out of your life, instead of hearing him, you'll see a grasshopper. Unworthy, guilty, Grasshopper. I tell you, we were always saying our world needs a revival. The world can't have a revival. Only the church can have a revival. The church needs a revival. The church needs an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The church needs a new conviction against sin. The church needs a new hunger for Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You see, when I allow things to stay in my life, that displeased God. There is a sense of fear and uncertainty about me. The proverb says, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Hallelujah. The righteous are as bold as a lion. I am finished. Stand up with me, please. It's 11.50. Here's what I'm asking. Wednesday night, we're going to do some praying for each other. Just praying. This morning, here's what I'm asking. Did anybody hear me tell the truth? Did anybody hear me tell the truth? Do you believe the church needs a revival? Do you believe there's sin in the camp? And do you believe that the only way for the strength and boldness of Christ to rise up in us again is for us to fall down at the feet of Jesus and want nothing but Jesus? Then then come down and join me. I'm not dismissing. So this this is not a time to leave. I'm I'm asking you to come down and join me As, as, as close as you can get.
Okay, here's another confession. So, everybody in here and all over the country and around the world knows that this is a big day. This is a big day, right? I'm not going to say the name, but it's a big day. So, every, every Sunday, my family will come over. That's four daughters, three sons-in-law, eight grandchildren, and dogs. <laughs> and it is a chaotic, loud, messy place to be. But because of this day, I think Sandra and the girls decided to do something a little different. You know, they say, hey. So, Doug's not up there, is he? I have a son-in-law who's from Cincinnati. Sandra and I used to be from Cincinnati. And the thing in Cincinnati is Skyline Chili. Anybody know about Skyline? I got a witness over here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a specialty up in there. And you pour it over spaghetti. Or you cover it, your hot dogs with it. So we're going to have all this special stuff. And homemade ice cream. That's what she wanted to do. And so I'm sitting there yesterday thinking, yeah, look at it's gonna be good. And the Holy Spirit pricked me and said, Do you realize you are more excited about tomorrow night than you are tomorrow morning? You're right, Lord. What's wrong with me? What in the world am I thinking? What happens tomorrow night? It's just going to be for several hours and it's over. But what happens tomorrow? What happens here now is for eternity. Do you see how, how quickly sin, worldliness can influence your thinking? It scares me. He's coming soon. I don't want to be playing around with this world. So I'm asking you to help me say to God this morning, forgive us of our sins and send revival to our church. Will you do it? Yeah, just lift a hand or both hands and say it to Him. Ask Him for it. In Jesus' mighty name. Lord Jesus, I didn't even know that was happening. Lord, I didn't even realize that you were being offended by that. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry for all the other stuff that I, that I just won't deal with sometimes. I'm sorry, Lord, because I really want you. I want you. I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. I want to know you in the likeness of your sufferings. I want to know you being made conformable to your death. I want to die so that I can know you better. So I'm sorry, Lord. And I speak for this church because you put me here. We're sorry, Lord. I want you to move. I want you to fill us with your spirit. I want you to convict me. I want you to take me to my knees. I want you to make my eyes wet with tears. and I want to be full of repentance. I want to please you, Lord. I, I want to go to heaven, Lord. We sung this song many times. We're going to sing it again, David. Jesus, give me Would you sing it from your heart? Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this one. Give me 
this would certainly be a good time to dismiss. But I believe, I, I don't think there's anybody here that isn't thinking about something that needs to go. I really feel that. There's nobody that isn't thinking of at least one thing. This, I got to get, this is not good. It's, it's a stumbling block. Do it. Do it. It'll be one of the greatest days in your life when you just do it. Do it for God. Do it because of God. Do it to please God. And God will pour Himself upon you and in you like you have never known Him before. You never give up anything for God that He doesn't replace it with more of Himself. Oh, that was beautiful, wasn't it? I'm giving this up for God. Then He's going to give you more of Himself. Amen. So as you go, go knowing that God loves you. He's spoken to you. He's hungry to have fellowship with you. His greatest desire is for you to enjoy Him. Amen. Yes. But also go getting rid of that which keeps you from enjoying Jesus. Amen. Amen. Here we go. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, amen. Can I say one thing? Hang on, David. Hang on. Don't argue with me. Really, I'm very serious. Don't wait on me to say I, I disagree. I, how can, I don't want to. I've already said it. Now it's between you and God. Bye-bye. <laughs>